Thank you for having me on a slightly more uplifting topic as, uh, yes, uh, gender-based gender -based violence is um, a very important topic, obviously, and uh, I was very happy to share my own story, but I'm even happier to talk about uh, entrepreneurship and what we can do and what we should do to support more women. And I can tell you in my own experience, uh, it has been awful. So it's absolutely no surprise that of all female-based uh, startups, globally around two, three percent of funding go to women. So I had this myself when I was looking for investment financing uh, loans for my idea of the nine three years ago. I met so many closed doors, uh, steely faces, uninterest, a lot of comments about women not needing these spaces, not wanting the space. Some of those are very cultural. I know the concept of members clubs is very Anglo-Saxon and so not understood perhaps in the rest of Europe or other parts of the world. But ultimately I was being told that as a woman, my idea and my business plan didn't have legs. Now, what's interesting about my own uh, story of the nine is that I worked very closely with my husband to help set up the business because he is a Belgian national, whereas I'm still not. And he speaks all the national languages, which I do not. I speak French, but I don't speak Dutch. So he would often accompany me to meetings, especially with Flemish investors or bankers. And the reaction towards him and towards me were very pointedly different. I can also give you an example of when we were talking about maybe co-founding uh, the business together. My husband was offered an unlimited credit card and I was given a 1,000 euro limit. So this is just one example. We were going 50-50 now. This was completely equal shares. This is just one example of where we were treated differently. And then when we asked the bank why this would be or why this was the case, um, I was told it was simply an oversight. So that's a, that's a, a nice <laughs> introduction onto the challenges facing uh, women in business. Wow, that is uh, quite something, Georgia. And it's something we would never know if we didn't speak about it, right? But something that I'm sure a lot of women have experienced uh, in different ways. And then, you know, you're just told it's an exception or an oversight, as you say, when it's actually oftentimes mm -hmm. systemic and ingrained in our cultures, right? Why do you think, because there seems to be a trend in recent years, and I know you agree with me, uh, why do you think more women are choosing to leave the typical nine to five world and start their own businesses? Oh, that's a good question. And I think there are multiple answers to that. I think one, surely COVID has given all of us, male, female, non-binary, the reperception, the, the kick that we needed to reassess our lives, what do we want to do with our time? Do we want to be working um, for a company or one company for the rest of our days? Are we enjoying what we're doing? Or often, and especially in women's cases, and I say this from the nine in my membership of the women I know, maybe we've had a side business or side hustle, if we want to be cool, and actually, that's a, more of a passion project. And that's where we want to invest our time and energy and not say the daily nine to five. I don't want to say drudgery, but in compared to a passion project, it could be seen as a uh, cumbersome task. I also think, uh, let's be honest, uh, women have been adversely affected by COVID-19 in all sectors. So in 2020 alone, in December 2020 in the US, everyone who was made uh, redundant, they say, it was actually a woman, simply because we're looking at social and healthcare sectors, which were adversely affected and who tend to be predominantly employed by women. So when women are at the front line of the uh, unfortunate layoffs or the um, cutbacks, it's obvious that we do need to step up and we think to ourselves, okay, I have no job security. Obviously, I have perhaps less loyalty in this business than I thought I did. So I'm gonna set, set up myself. And so it's interesting, Forbes came out with a report recently, um, again for the US, 
showing that white men are actually now the minority business owners and that women of color actually have taken over, I think five times uh, the rate per population. So it's certainly a trend that we're seeing this idea of uh, be more, achieve more, maybe because we don't feel that we're gonna get a lot from our more traditional um, employment structures. Yes, and I think we're gonna see more and more of that uh, over the coming years. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna talk more about that. I wanna move on though, uh, for now, to a young lady in Romania. Now, Delia, Delia Avram, is a barista, trainer, roaster, and coffee lover, as she calls it herself. She's the founder and proud owner of Rock Specialty Coffee Shop in Baia Mare. I have some question, a uh, question for you. Um, as a young woman who's excelling in a field that is quite highly male dominated in the roastery and specialty coffee industry, uh, could you please share with us what kind of things that you've gone through and what kind of lessons have you learned along the way? Hello, Camila. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, super happy to be here. Uh, before I answer your question, I can only agree uh, to the challenges that were on the path, both because I, was, I am a woman and uh, because it was a new field. Seven, eight years ago, there was only one specialty coffee in Romania. There was only one uh, roastery who were focused on quality. So for me as a coffee enthusiast, even if I knew I really loved the product, it was very hard to find information. There was no information on the internet. Even if it was there and nobody knew about it, there were no people to follow, to learn from. So in the beginning, I um, let's say that I was really sure that I wanted to stay in this field because I love the product. And the more I uh, started to learn about it, I started to connect with people. Uh, people who were uh, mostly men because uh, there was a roaster, there was a coffee um, owner who were all, always there. There was a man who did this. I was lucky enough to start this uh, career in um, Bucharest where I had access to Let's say that was the place where the first specialty coffee in Romania was. So I was access, I had access to the roaster there. And he told me that he brings coffee from all around the world. And I was like, oh my God, I mean, this is like amazing. You really bring coffee from Ethiopia and from Nicaragua. And he shared with me what he learned. Then when I moved to Cluj, I was pretty sure I wanted to stay in the same field. And the main issue that happened was that nobody wanted to hire a woman to work behind the bar, to work with coffee only as a waitress. So the only opportunity for me to stay in the field was to be a waitress. Uh, I would have taken that if nothing else would have been available, but I started um, looking for the right people. I started looking for the product that I love. I found a micro roastery and the moment I wanted to start working with them and they had, they needed another person. I was the one they were like, Hey, come join us, come work with us. So it is pretty hard to be a woman and to get in a field where mostly men are working but the moment you start asking about it and I mean I was always asking for it I want to do this why won't you take me I am capable to do this I know that I need to learn some things uh, I will learn just point me the direction and um, I was always up for challenges maybe that's why I uh, managed to um, gather so much information Another um, issue, um, because in 2014, nobody was hiring women in this industry to work uh, behind the bar. The moment I um, needed uh, uh, some colleagues to help me in um, the coffee chain I work, I was very um, uh, focused on uh, women. I said that any time a woman came to the interview, I wanted to give her a chance. Even if there was a more qualified man, I know this is 
maybe sounds very feminist, feminist or uh, it's sexist or something. But I wanted to do this for for the girls out there. And uh, of course, I was not uh, saying no to guys. Uh, no, you cannot come and work because you are a man. But uh, anytime a girl wanted to come and uh, join me and work, even she didn't have the knowledge i prepared the um, the information in a book and some trainings and i was like, like yes you want to learn this is what you have to do and go for it so i was able to provide uh, um let's say to open a door for people who want it and uh, to facilitate uh, facilitate the access to women today i know so many talented baristas uh, girls women from the from uh, my town from others other town and there are there's i mean we are super uh, attentive to details and this is a field where women can actually uh, do very well because we have this attention to everything that goes around and specialty coffee it's a field where it's not about coffee and only coffee it's about all the details that matter in order to have the perfect I hope this answers your questions, Camila. Yes, it's uh, it's really good to hear you speak about this, Delia. It's so interesting that you kind of pushed through boundaries and you decided you want to do this, even if you met a lot of challenges along the way. And my question to you would be, how important do you think it is to have female role models um, when it comes to our decisions in terms of career and what we believe we can do. Um, did you have any women role models in the field of specialty coffee or are you simply a pioneer? I'd say that in Romania, my role models were uh, men. There was uh, this uh, roastery uh, owner, uh, Rad from Papa Jacques. Then uh, there was the coffee shop uh, owner who um, told me uh, who taught me that you can actually work with your uh, employees and be a part of the team and actually um, be there involved not just the boss uh, then in Cluj I had uh, two more role models they were there were always uh, always men because they were already here and uh, they were um, they were were able to either to push me to go beyond my limits, like uh, the previous employee, he always uh, gave me new challenges. It was not a matter of you need to do this. No, it's you are capable of doing this. You have to do that. And um, of course, there were things that I really wanted to like the competitions. Um, when I was for my first competition, I was disqualified. And I was like, I was very upset, even if I didn't prepare so much. And it was not something uh, that came out as a um, surprise that I was disqualified. But I was disappointed in myself. Next year, I wanted to um, be better. And uh, with uh, a little bit of help from my team and from um, the previous uh, employee I used, I, the, the last one I used to work with, uh, just because he was there and he said that, yes, you are capable of doing this, I was able to go the extra mile to achieve um, the second place on, in the nationals the following year. And uh, long story short, uh, another year afterwards, uh, I was able to get the first place. So it is possible. You really need to have people that either believe you or believe in you or challenge you. Challenge you. I'm the type of woman who, um, if you say to me that you cannot do that, I will uh, demonstrate to you that I can do that because I want and I will. And. Um, I, uh, till two, two years ago, there were only male role models. Two years ago, there was uh, a, girl, a woman from Poland, Aga. Uh, she, was the, she is the first uh, world barista champion as a woman. And seeing her competition, I was there and uh, um, I was actually feeling everything that she was doing. And uh, she empowered me in a way that uh, it's hard to describe in words. Uh, two years later, after she won the competition, I was able to meet her face to face. And it was 
it was something really nice to see that another woman from another country in the same field, just because she wanted to uh, be the best, she was able to, um, I mean, she got the work, workplace, she got work, the recognition, and that's because she was better than everyone else. That's really awesome. And uh, I love that you got to meet her and that uh, you got to be empowered by her. And you can pass that on in turn like you're doing right now. So I love that story. Thank you, Delia. We'll talk more about that. But I want to also go to our next uh, lady from Romania, uh, another young lady, uh, Bianca Tatar is the vice president, project manager, and youth worker at the Aegis Association in Bayamare. I got the privilege of listening to you a few years ago um, at the European Youth Capital Conference here in Cluj, because you were a member of the coordinating team of the Bayamare Romanian Youth Capital in 2018-2019, and you were a member of the team that conducted the city's application for the European Youth Capital's title in 2019-2020 right so you are a quite a go-getter and a youth activist and i was very impressed to hear you speak then and i'm very excited to hear you speak now so bianca i want to ask you how did you become a youth activist uh, or as a young woman have you encountered any kind of gender related challenges in your field of work how did you overcome and how are you dealing with these? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Camilla, for inviting me to this event. I was very, very excited uh, for it from the very beginning. And I honestly feel honored and very um, anxious, actually, to be here with all these wonderful women. Uh, so as to the first question, how did I become a youth activist? How did I get to be in the field of youth? Uh, it is because of another powerful woman. <laughs> Uh, as you said in, in the presentation on, on Facebook, I am actually um, one of the young women who had the great opportunity to have a powerful woman empowering me in, uh, in my field of uh, work. Uh, and actually, if I am to look back, I, I think that throughout my life, uh, I have always had and I've always been fortunate enough to have a powerful woman in my um, corner so to speak, and it's made all the difference in the world. Now, um, from the point of field, uh, from the point of view of work, um, I have to say that Diana Sabo was the woman behind it all. For me, uh, at first, our relationship began uh, as a youth worker, young person, <laughs> so to speak. She, she offered me some, some counseling uh, services, the part of the, the activity that the youth worker does here in Romania. Uh, and I have been able to see this amazing impact that this had uh, on myself and on my personal life, on my professional life. Uh, it, it is that how I want, how I said, I want to be able to do this too. How do you do that? Uh, I want to do this too, because at, the, at that time I was a student uh, at, the city at the university center here in Bayamare. Uh, and to be honest, I was a bit lost because we do not have uh, really any accessible uh, career orientation services. So as many young people of my age at the time, I was very confused as to what I'm going to do with my future. And um, having her as a role model and as someone who came towards me uh, and showed me uh, what her um, profession can do, uh, it has been life changing and this is how I got to be here. And actually the trip continued, uh, the adventure continued uh, because um, I became a vice president in her organization uh, now and it was her that empowered me to uh, be a part of the Romanian Youth Capital uh, Program 2018-2019 here in Bayamare. Um, it was her and uh, maybe a few other uh, women who uh, supported me but she was the lead one in presenting the Romanian Youth Gala in 2018 which was one of the dreams that I had never thought would come true to to a, be able to be on the stage and present a national event in the field of youth um, and I think one of the most life-changing events was the moment when uh, she had this she was the moderator of this tv show youth tv show at the local tv station 
And at some point she said, I believe you should do this from now on. And she passed on the, the TV show to me. And I was there for a year. And this really had an impact because uh, as a young lady, as a young girl, I always wanted to be on TV. It was something that was one of those dreams that you dream with your eyes open every time you see. But at the time, and even at the time that Diana said this to me, I said, this cannot happen because I'm not pretty enough. This was something that was in my head that um, I believe that in some way society encouraged it. And then there was, then this happened. And that was the time when I said, okay, if this happened, then anything is possible. <laughs> this is the moment that made you realize that it does not matter, I mean, how you look. I mean, it only matters um, how competent you are and who you are. And this is how I came to represent the city uh, twice in front of the European Youth Capital jury, actually. And uh, of course, the, the support that women offered me and Diana offered me in the field of Europe youth uh, has not stopped. And this is why I believe that I'm very, very fortunate to, to, to be here. And it is something that I look forward in doing myself uh, every time I have the, the opportunity to. Now, in terms of challenges, they did happen. Not so much in the field of youth, because uh, in this field and in the NGO field, generally, I believe that we are more um, open to these things, I think. I mean, I, I have not met, I cannot say that I have met many people who would consider gender an issue uh, related to your competence. I mean, it, it is not something that we, <laughs> that we do generally here. But when I was in the university, for example, I did feel that when I was in a leadership position in my students' organization, the students' organization at that time, uh, people from the university management tended to behave in a different way towards me than towards the president of the organization when I had to step in and take his place when he was gone. Uh, and the differences between the in the behavior were so fine that I do not believe they were doing it in an intentional way. I do not believe that they were aware of the fact that they're acting differently towards a woman uh, than towards a man, because it is something that is so fine and so, um, so small, I mean, and so deep that it is, you cannot say that they are violent or aggressive in any way, but there is a difference. It's like this glass wall that's between you and those people. And they cannot even see it because it's see-through, right? But it is there and it is stopping us from having a real conversation. Um, there were also differences in the way that I acted, uh, in the way that I communicated with my colleagues in the organizations. I have noticed that most of the people reacted differently towards the same behavior uh, according to the gender of the person who was presenting it. Like we, we really had this uh, mirror people. One of them was a girl and one of them was a boy, like uh, a young lady and a young man. Uh, and they presented the same uh, sort of behavior. And then people would come and complain about her, but not about him. If he was the one raising his voice, they would automatically uh, follow him. If she was the one raising her voice, they would come to us and to the board of management at that time and say she is bossy she is yelling at us she is telling us what to do this is not something you can do she will she is not okay her behavior needs to be changed and yeah I, I believe that there are some issues that we still have to to face but to be honest I do not know how to face them because they are so fine that up until that this point aside from trying to set an example and trying to empower and show them uh, how things would normally work, uh, I admit that I cannot find systematic ways of fighting this. And I, sometimes I really feel powerless. <laughs> Thank you, Bianca, and that's such a good point. Uh, and I think you formulated it very nicely, exactly what a lot of us um, face in our day-to-day -day life. And it's really hard to pinpoint and it's really hard to describe, and I think you did an excellent job in doing just that. Um, so thank you so much. I wanna ask you one follow-up question before we move to our next uh, speaker who just arrived. Welcome, Noemi. Um, 
so Bianca, these gender related challenges, this glass wall that you encountered, um, do you think it had any kind of impact on your media, the medium or long term development or success? Mm. Thankfully, I believe that I had enough power, enough uh, people to support me and to empower me, not only women, men too. That is not to say I did not have amazing men who were backing me up and this is amazing. Uh, in order to somehow balance it or counter, uh, or counter it. I mean, the, the love and support that I got uh, was stronger than these, stronger than this glass wall. Um, but I do have to say that once you start noticing these things, there is no going back and you start seeing them and you, you cannot unsee them. Uh, and I still believe that we are uh, underrepresented and I, I was able to begin to see where we still have work to do um, even on finer things that are not so obvious like gender-based violence or a women healthcare or so on and so forth, because these are things that generally people see not enough. We are still not doing enough in those areas. There are also still finer things that I think maybe if we work on those two, the other, the bigger ones would get some, uh, some help too. And I do remember this specific time where, uh, the, um, where we were signing the contract for the Romanian youth capital. And there was this big uh, table in front of the audience where several people were sitting in it, official leaders uh, who were taking charge of the signing of the contract. Uh, and at some point in the event, I was in the audience and I said to, to the colleague next to me, wait a minute, they're all men. Even if our team at the local level were mostly women, how did this happen? <laughs> and then there was one seat open. And at that seat, there was supposed to be a woman uh, from the program, the, the national program governance. Uh, she's the CSR and um, the communications director for uh, the bank that was financing the program. And then I said, okay, she's a bit late, but she will be here and she will take that seat. And hopefully this will look a bit better because I feel, <laughs> I feel this is not okay. And then Nicoletta, that's her name, finally comes through the door with two or three other men and one of them was um, the president, I think, of some sort of, uh, or had a, a management position. And guess what? He was the one to take this, the empty seat. So there were seven or eight people or men there. And that is when I started to, uh, to really uh, question some things. Mm. That's quite an experience. and. It's something that you pointed out that I very much uh, resonate with is once you see that there is a glass wall, you cannot unsee it. Um, but sometimes it takes a while for us to see it because we're so ingrained in this culture and this mindset. So thank you for pointing that out. Noemi, uh, thank you for joining us. You are in uh, the Netherlands, right? And yeah. you just made it through some, uh, some difficult barriers in terms of physical barriers, in terms of the uh, protests that are going on there, right? But we're, we're happy you could make it. Um, Noemi is a longtime friend of ours. Uh, she's a journalist with a PhD in political communication and an expert on migration and intercultural communication based on your experience as a journalist and a media professional, what are some of the silent stories of women in the workplace that you know of? Thank you, Camila. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to be here with you. And uh, actually, the silent stories uh, from, well, we could talk about the women in the media who are journalists, media producers, and the challenge that also Bianca was already talking about, the challenge of this basically, uh, I think the glass ceiling in media, as gonna show you some numbers, is even higher than in other, uh, in basically, in other fields. And the, this is interesting to, to see also the numbers. I was glad that I arrived on time to listen a little bit of what Bianca was saying. And the silent stories also on how competitive is um, the media floor and also the political power and the power behind the power, I think it plays a role. 
And I would like to talk about that, Camila, but I think it's also interesting to say that because of the lack of women in some of these high positions as editors, producers, also some of the stories that we hear are there or not there, or there is a bias on the stories. Uh, for example, the stories from war, stories uh, from uh, trauma, stories from women who should be the main um, character on the story, but uh, sometimes I interview some journalists who went to war zones and in some countries, if you are not a woman, the men will not be allowed to be in the kitchen. So he's not gonna know the story, at least of half of the population in that country. You may interview the guys in the military, you may talk with the politicians, but in some countries, women are of course not in the army, of course not in political positions. You're not allowed to go to the kitchen. You will actually know, don't know the stories of half of the population in that country. And that's one of the, the challenges that the women are not there telling the story with the camera and the microphone. The stories of the women are not there in the screen and the newspapers and the online media that we follow. I want to hear more about that. Um, but can I just ask you to go a little bit more into what you think is the role of the media in shaping the, the narrative and the way we see women um, as a society? as communities? The role of the media will be to give visibility to all the stories. And there is a, what I try, I call it the silent narratives, the narratives that are not there, the stories that are not there. And this is spiral of silence. If you don't give the voice to the woman, some of these stories from women will never be there. And, and actually, this is actually one of the things that we need to do advocacy for, that uh, if women are not there in the front line of the media, some of these stories will never be published or will never be on the spot. Uh, so I think um, I think you're having a wonderful program that covers these stories and these challenges. And I saw that actually you mentioned some taboos of uh, challenges that women experience and some stories also from daily life um, uh, that actually are not there. Uh, together with stories of uh, harassment and the context of work, but also I think you mentioned in your in your program uh, I, that you will also talk about this trauma, also uh, stories of trauma that is very difficult uh, for women to be on the spot because uh, you want to still give your confidentiality, also stories of same. So we do have a challenge there because some of the stories, the most difficult ones to tell, uh, we want to protect the victim. We want to protect the woman who went through that. And because of that, we don't tell the story. And I do have a moral dilemma with this. I wanted to share that with you because I think some of these stories of trauma, these stories who are taboo in our society, including things that are more daily life in our lives, living in Western Europe, uh, that I think you mentioned things like menstruation, postpartum depression, um, abortion, all these stories that are very difficult to tell are hardly never there. Or when they're there, they're in a way that maybe we don't appreciate because it's too sensationalistic or just to sell news. Exactly. And I think it's a, a very good point. And the more I read and study about it, the more I realize that I myself carry certain prejudices or stereotypes about women as a woman um, because we have been met with all these arguments right oh but that's just very few people who experience that or you know it's it's sensationalized like you say or and the reason for that is that um, like you say it's very hard to tell these stories when we had our 16 stories campaign we heard stories of women from all over the world who had experienced different forms of harassment and abuse. And um, it could be emotional, it could be economic, it could be discrimination in various forms. And the reason it's so hard to get these stories out there is because women who experienced it are not gonna be very eager to share it uh, for good reason. It's very difficult to go through. It's difficult to relive. It's difficult to share. Also because there is the tendency for victim shaming and victim blaming, right? Um, so there's very few stories out there. Um, and so we tend to think it only happens to very few people, which is not really the case. Tereka Oropilia, or if you wanna use an easier name, Eya, uh, welcome. You're sitting in Norway right now. Yes. And because you're currently based in Bergen, 
um, as a PhD research fellow in the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences, uh, where you're part of the Kindno Center, Kindergarten Knowledge Center for Systemic Research on Diversity and Sustainable Futures. Uh, your research is on the exploration of intergenerational interactions and programs between young children and older adults. So we're really excited to hear from you, Aya. Um, and you are currently in one of my favorite places in the world. So lucky you, I bet it's raining. If you could please tell us about your experience of women lifting each other up in the field that you're working in of early childhood research. Thank you so much, Camilla. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I feel so empowered already. Um, and I'm just really excited to be here. I will share some photos of my life <laughs> um, to share. And Camilla, it's not actually raining in Bergen. It's snowing. Oh, what a joy. And it's been sticking for quite some days now. So tomorrow we'll go sledding. <laughs> if you can see the screen in front of you, and if you can find the smallest person in the group, that it's me. <laughs> That's me, Aya. I'm originally from the Philippines. And this photo was taken on the first day of my international master in early childhood education and care, funded by the Erasmus Mundus program. So I've been very lucky to have been part of the program. And it was a joint master's program at program between four European universities in Norway, Sweden, Ireland, and Malta. And even back then, that small girl knew the track that she wanted to pursue. I really wanted to continue early childhood research. And um, four years after graduating master's, I found myself once again leaving the Philippines and moving back to Norway to do exactly that. And I've been very privileged to be sort of because here in Norway, PhD fellows are part of the workforce and they're actually paid to do research. And that is something that is very unique. And imagine being paid for something that you want to do. That's the position I'm in right now. It's fabulous. Thank you, Norway. <laughs> well, it's been, it's been a ride because early childhood education and care research is really like a baby girl in a world full of men. It's only fairly recent when it has been recognized as its own science and its own research field for a long time. Um, the field of early childhood education and care was not considered part of the educational system. And for a long time, we have leaned on the works of scholars from developmental psychology or other scientific fields, and we were not a field on our own. And we had different theoretical paradigms. We had many the, many of the biggest names in early childhood research consists of, well, the, it's still dominated by what we, what some people call old white men, with the exception of Maria Montessori. The names of Friedrich Frebel, Rudolf Steiner, Lev Vygotsky, Howard Gardner, Eric Erikson, Jer Jerome Bruner, Abraham Maslow, Jean Piaget, John Dewey, Loris Melaguzzi are still leading this field, despite the fact that early childhood education is still largely viewed as a woman's job. And in fact, there are a number of research researches showing that there is a need to balance out genders and hire more men in this field because care is also a men's job. It's, it's, it's everybody's job to care and educate each other, and it should be part of early childhood education. And just to share, because this there's this lack of men in the field of early childhood education, more men are actually encouraged to apply for PhD and postdoc positions. And they are actually prioritized over women so that there will be a gender balance. It's a, it's a different field. And thankfully for me, in retrospect, I have been able to reach this point in my life because of the support of strong women around me. I have three strong women researchers and academics supporting me in the field of early childhood research in the form of my supervisors, Ellen Erickson Odegaard, Elizabeth Jane White, and Gloria Quinones. They're from different parts of the world. One is Norwegian, one is from New Zealand, and one is from Australia. Uh, nay, she's in Australia, but she's actually Mexican. 
and some of these women are um, editor in chief of uh, early childhood research publications, and they have really blazed a trail for me and other young researchers to follow. It has not been easy being a researcher, especially during the time of the pandemic, and social science research, such as mine, are anchored on communication and being able to collaborate and actually be with people, especially young children. We work with a field that is very physical and we have to engage with each other. And the pandemic really caused everybody to pivot, even myself, I, it caused me to pivot and I had to redesign my research project. And I'm just really grateful that I have had and um, still have um, strong women surrounding me and lifting me up during this time. And I hope to be even have as a comp half as accomplished as they are, rocking the world of research, standing up in institutions, lobbying for children, and for more funding in early childhood research, because otherwise, we will not be funded by governments or, yeah. And I'm also very privileged to have the support of my family and friends through these tough times, particularly from my partner and my mom, both strong women themselves. Uh, because of their support, I felt that I could be brave too. And that's really where I'm coming from. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more from everybody. Thank you so much, Aya. It's encouraging to, to listen to you. Um, and it's so true what you're saying that we need more men also in the care sector, in the care for children, care for people in general. So Naomi, we are ready for you if you want to share your presentation. Yes, I will, I will try to, to be quick and then go to the main points. What inspired me to be a, a journalist mainly was telling the stories, the silent stories, the stories that are not there. And one of the stories of minorities, including women who are not on the spot for different reasons. And I would like to start with this uh, topic that we've been talking uh, also with Bianca and in the introduction, uh, when Camila was asking me a couple of questions, I think sometimes it's good to look at numbers because uh, somehow the numbers are even more shocking than we expect. So I'm just gonna show you uh, a couple of, of numbers and then make a reflection about this because it's like, who is telling us the stories? Who is behind the story? And then we make a reflection of the stories that we see or the stories that are not there and why. Just very quickly, if we look about uh, how many men are actually in high positions in media organizations, it's even lower than in other sectors and in other fields. As you can see, in media management positions, only 27% of women and 73% of men. If we go actually to who are the experts, it's even more shocking. And this is recent data from different uh, sources from the global media reporting. You can find this in different uh, organizations who came to the conclusion also during the times of COVID. Who are the experts telling us the stories about COVID? And the conclusion was most of them were men, around 80%. So you can imagine that actually, especially as experts, still uh, we have more men than women. Uh, there is other data that say that one in three journalists is a woman. However, I think the stories about experts is something to highlight. I'm going to tell you a small story. And this is data from the Deutsche Welle. And as you can see, they talk about how many people were quote and how many people were interviewed. OK, um, keeping this data in mind, I tell you a short story. Recently, I participated in an investigative journalist report. We were four men and four women. Actually, one of the stories been finally published in The Guardian and two in the Spanish media. This was investigative journalists, so we were hired, I was hired to do research for this media reporting. Uh, from the four men, all the four men were mentioned in the main media. From the four women, um, one of the women was mentioned in one of the media, and I was mentioned in one of the reports. The two girls who participated in the reports doing interviews were not mentioned in that. They were mentioned as part of the team of this organization. I'm not gonna mention the organization, but there is an organization doing, and this is very common. So actually to do advocacy in the name of this woman, I contact one of the guys from the newspaper because uh, three of the interviews that he mentioned were my interviews and the other were from the other girls. And he say, yes, you are mentioned as part of the team. It's like, where is my name? Where is the name of the other girls? Of course, the name of the two guys was there, 
my name and the name of the other girls was not there. At the end, they published a line to say thank you to me and the other girls who participate in this investigative journalism. And this guy took the credit of our um, stories. This is something that I'm sure the four guys who participate, the four of them were on the main uh, newspapers and reports. From the four women, we need to fight for our name, otherwise they forgot and we are part of the team. And who is in the team? Well, no names. And this was more an expert report. And I go back to this idea of like, how many times a woman are not quote as experts. And also even when woman is uh, the main journalist, the uh, broadcasting, many women actually go to men as experts to tell the story. This is one side of the coin who is telling the story. And now we go to the other side of the story, the silent stories and the silent narratives, the stories that are not there. I think this is really important to see why the voices of women in the media are important, why they should be there, because without this representation, without this visibility, it's gonna be very hard to find any kind of equality in our society. I think uh, in this sense, I'm gonna say also a couple of stories of my challenge when I was trying to tell stories from women, because we want to protect them, especially these stories that are sensitive, protecting their voices, protecting their faces, the challenge of telling sensitive stories. Um, this is actually uh, um, Jordan in the border with Syria, Mafra, uh, like eight miles from Syria. Uh, most of the women don't want to be on the picture. It's very difficult to also publish a story without a picture. So you need to find a way. So this was the only way I could get her a story with her picture. And you need to be very creative. This is also another story from a, a Syrian lady. And actually it was the only way it was like, okay, you can publish a, a picture of my hand. Uh, she has a tattoo made by her daughter, that is Anna, that was the first letter of her name. Uh, uh, however, it is a challenge to publish stories without names, stories without pictures. Recently, I participated also in a webinar about uh, the situation in Canary Island, where 80% are men, but 20% are women. We couldn't find a way to have one single woman uh, on the spot to be on the online in this event. No problem to get the stories of men. And the challenge is that the stories that are more challenging, the stories that are more painful, the stories of migrants and refugees who have a hard time and they, um, that are not there are the stories of women. So this is a challenge that we face. These are a couple of quotes from journalists I interview who actually are uh, uh, main, in, I mean, journalists who publish stories in main media uh, in Spain and also in the UK. And one of the conclusions from this report, uh, it was actually, it's much easier to publish stories from men than the stories from women. So that's also one of the reasons why they are there. I'm just gonna ask you a question in the movies, who is telling the story? A little quiz. In Hollywood, who do you think that are the directors? If you wanna write that in the chat and we do this very quick and I'm gonna finish in a minute. What do you think? 50%, 35%, 20%, 10%, 6%. And we are talking about Hollywood, okay? So if you think about it, actually, 10% of women are directors, 19 writers, 24 producers, and 70 editors. As you can see, editors is the most popular profession among women working in Hollywood. We are talking about entertainment, and I think this is also really important to see who is telling the stories, who are the filmmakers, who have the speaking roles, and who are the main characters. I just leave you with this, and uh, I just only want to finish with uh, some small comment about um, online media, and also what is the digital gap, because sometimes Actually, when we talk about media now, we need to talk about internet. Uh, we did a small uh, in, in, well, research uh, in the Netherlands with a refugee woman. And one of the challenges that we find during the times of COVID is the digital gap. And I think we need to take into account the digital gap. How is this a challenge for women in our society? And if you are not able to do things online, then you are really disconnected. So how we can help women to connect in this digital gap and I think the question is, what is our role as women to bring this gap and help the woman to connect also in the digital society? So thanks so much. That was a little bit my input and I am looking forward to having a conversation with you about this. Thank you, Noemi. I wanna first address the question from Olivia. Uh, you have a female friend who is a software engineer in a highly competitive environment. 
And in spite of generally going against the current and fighting stereotypes, she points out that she also struggles with potentially being offered jobs based purely on positive discrimination. There are some big companies that have started hiring more women so that they comply to new regulations on gender equality, or they are having a genuine attempt to counteract gender discrimination. Um, aware of this, uh, she feels slightly apprehensive about some opportunities that come her way. So the question is, have any of you felt skeptical when accepting a job position? And what advice would you give to this young lady who's struggling with this? Um, and how do we find a healthy balance between challenging the status quo and kindly engaging with what is currently happening? Yes, if I may, Olivia. Um... Thank you for your question. And it is a reality, this positive discrimination that you're talking about. I have always felt like a diversity hire <laughs> um, because I'm Asian. I come from the Philippines. It's a poor country. It's, it's a developing country. Um, and I've always been privileged to get these scholarships from the Western world. And although I'm in the field of early childhood education, it is still part of the educational system. So I have also struggled with this question of, am, am I, was I just hired because I was, you know, this diverse kind of person who can be present as somebody exotic and part of their roster, you know? But in my opinion, and it's myself. I have, I'm not alone in this struggle. Your friend is not alone in this struggle, especially in the field of IT, where women are not that, not that dominant yet. Um, I have a group of friends and we were thinking about this and we were always like, but should, should that stop us from accepting opportunities? It shouldn't. And we came to the conclusion that we should just work it to our advantage if we are going to be empowered, then we are going to choose the best um, option for us. So if they offer us an opportunity, then we choose what's best for us, then we rock that world, and then we just overcome being just a diversity hire. We sort of prove everybody wrong in that position, and we just show them what we've got. So that's, in, that's my personal view on it. I really don't mind being a being positively discriminated because they always feel like um, maybe she will be like this. There are there are some expectations just because you come from a different context. So I just prove everybody wrong or everybody right, depending on the, the situation. Yeah, that's just my two cents. Thank you, Aya. I think a lot of us can relate to that. May I say something? Yes, please. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I was a part of a positive uh, discrimination group. I applied for a sponsorship, and because I was a woman in an industry dominated by men, I got a sponsorship and other colleagues who are men did not get it. We had the same qualifications, and the only difference between them and me was the fact that I was a woman. Honestly, I was super happy I got it. I uh, took the most out of it. I went to the national scene i used the gear um i uh, got as a sponsorship and it helped me and i uh, proved everybody that even a woman can do that so i think if it's positive we should take it i mean it's you you take it and you uh prove it prove them wrong or prove them right as um as uh, she said uh, before um so yeah it shouldn't bother us. If people are kind, it shouldn't be uh, something that uh, creates discomfort. We should be happy if people are kind. We should be happy if positive things happen. And we should take advantage, not try to find the bad thing in positive things. That's what I think. This also makes me uh, think about our next session, which is on women in politics and possibly talking about gender quotas, which will also be interesting. Uh, but Bianca, please. Share with us, what do you think about this? I was working in this uh, NGO domain. I was um, a lot of times in a position where I had to be aware of the gender balance when, I don't know, selecting participants for a training or any other activity. So I do 
understand this feeling that it is a bit artificial maybe that it is not something that comes natural to us still to to have gender balance in our activities in all our activities but and i i was a bit i, I also had this question like do we select women or young girls just because they are women and young girls and of course in in the field of youth the situation is not as complicated i think because up until that point probably um i mean the education is hopefully mostly the same for everyone uh but in the field of work i do believe that she should take the opportunities and decide for her of course if she believes that uh she wants that it or not because most likely it has been harder for her to get to that point than it was for her colleagues who are men and i do believe that most of the times it is harder for women to get to some positions that are um um leadership positions or highly accepted positions so uh this was the conclusion that i got so far that it is okay to do it even if it is a bit artificial or imposed from outside because most likely the experiences up until that point have not been fair or have not been equal so especially if that was the case take the opportunity uh, and if i am to be a bit maybe mean uh, I do not hear of many men questioning their opportunities when they get them, even if probably they got them um, or they were there because of their gender. Most of the time, they're not aware, they are not aware of that. But I do believe that we should have this comfort too of not um, questioning the opportunities that come our way because of our gender. Thank you so much, Bianca. Um, Georgia. Uh, yes, I agree 100% with what Bianca just said. And I want to just remind everyone that we are still living in a very male dominated world that has been run by a patriarchal structure. So any opportunity that we are given, we should take with both hands. Men would absolutely not question an opportunity given to them. And in fact, I think even questioning this shows how much work we still have to do and feeds into this narrative that women are uh, more thoughtful, more considerate. No, I'm afraid to say the world is not thoughtful. The world is not considerate. You have to take it. Quota higher, doesn't matter. Show yourself, show your merit. That's the most important thing. Wonderful. Thank you, Georgia. I um, am very excited and I hope Olivia feels like her question was answered. I definitely got a lot of food for thought. Violeta asks, how would you classify the way women are greeted or singularly not greeted in a group of men and women, especially in the professional world. I resonate with that deeply here in Romania. Um, and could that be considered a microaggression? Respectful greeting sets the stage of, on acknowledging the woman, her contribution, or hearing her voice. If Bianca wants, I, I have a feeling she has something to say on it. I really don't know what to say because I have the same question. <laughs> I mean, uh, I I have the same um, dilemma that I haven't solved yet, honestly. Um, I, I do see this habit all around me that men shake hands with men in every uh, group. And if they greet women, which they sometimes do, I mean, half of the times maybe they do, they do it by kissing on the cheek or hugging them. So what happens when you are not very comfortable with kissing on the cheeks and hugging what happens if you are not comfortable letting someone uh into your personal space so closely to you at that time because that's not very okay what i have uh found to be a solution i mean just in in groups that you know people or work with is be very assertive about it and say okay this is something that I believe should be changed. I mean, if you enter a room, please, I mean, I would like you to shake hands with me too, even if I am a woman, uh, or I would like to be greeted this way. 
So express your feelings because most of the times, I mean, I think men should also get some credit because they are not very aware of what they do. <laughs> it is just something that has been passed down from generation to generation. And at some point we stop questioning it because it's just the way we do things. And if you are not in a context that um, helps you to be aware of the things, it's just a given, something that you accept, just like the glass wall. You see through it, so you might believe it's not there. So, you know, it, it's just uh, that this is all that I have found to be useful to be assertive and be uh, open about it with people that I work with or with groups that I am, I am in. And I honestly, from my part, I do not like either not to shake hands or anything. I'm okay with hello and probably a hug with, if we're really close. But other than that, I believe men or women, you should um, um, express your needs or your preferences. Thank you, Bianca. Um, I just want, in case you're not uh, from Romania or you don't understand what we are talking about here, um, when I moved to Romania as a Norwegian, I was shocked um, at how I was disregarded when I met other men, uh, when I was the only woman there, or if I was going out with my husband and we met other male acquaintances, they would simply not acknowledge me. They would not shake my hand, but they would also not meet my eyes and they would not look at me and they would not greet me. Um, and this to me coming from Norway uh, was very shocking and appalling. And I felt extremely disrespected and made feel very invisible. So I would say it's a microaggression, but I know now as I've lived here for a while that it's not necessarily intended that way. And so I understand where this question is coming from. And uh, yes, Bianca, do you want to say something else on that? Uh, I just I just want to say that I, I think I have uh, an example that would show where this is coming from. Uh, I grew up in the countryside, so th that is where this uh, habit of comes from here. And there was this colleague of mine who went to uh, one of the most traditional areas in uh, our area in Maramures, which is a county of, of Romania. And she worked with people from the, we call it Salvamont, these people who take care of people who get lost on mountains. I don't know how you say it in English. <laughs> uh, and they, they work with, with them. And at some point, the people she met there, like highly educated people, so to speak, um, they shook hands with the man and they didn't even say hello to her. Like at, at that point, it was a bit, uh, taken further than the usual, just shaking hands and saying hello to, to women. And she asked it, she asked the guy, why do you guys here do not see me? Even if I am the coordinator of the project, excuse me, <laughs> Lord, thank you very much. And he said, oh, we do not uh, shake hands with women here because we do not know whose they are or whom they might belong to or which men they might belong to. <laughs> and it was, the, an actual answer in 2020 given to a woman <laughs> so uh, yeah the, the origin might be really aggressive for this habit believe it or not Bianca that's also an explanation that I've heard um, out of respect to my husband who would just simply ignore me which I should be grateful for or something um, anyway this is a very interesting topic. Of course, I feel it closely uh, because I experience it, still experience it often and um, learning to deal with it and be more assertive. Um, so move to Romania if you wanna learn to be assertive as a woman, it can be really helpful. So we have another question from Cindy. It's a comment with a question hidden inside of it. She says that uh, she was recently, her, one of her friends from Switzerland was part of a dinner group where one of her male friends mentioned his salary. Um, it was less money than her friend earns. And the first impulse was, oh no, how can that be? He is a man, he should earn more than me. He's the head of the family. After pondering on it for a while, she saw how wrong her thinking was, but it is, but is it not one of the issues that we need to battle our own views on old fashioned male and female role models and go out into the world and see it as our oyster? 
And on another note, should we as women not empower each other more like we do here today? Because in reality, I feel in the workplace, more often than not, we are competing against each other. Georgia, I'm looking at you because you're in this fabulous uh, old women's club. Uh, yes, up other women. Afraid, I was afraid you were going to ask me. Um, <laughs> is the workplace more conducive to women competing? Sadly, I think that's the case. I don't think we have to. Obviously, we have been hardwired by the patriarchy to fight each other rather than fighting them. So, of course, it's only natural that we continue to do this. What I am seeing, though, is a greater number of female mentors or sponsors um, helping each other. So there is more of a greater intergenerational support. I didn't experience that myself. I had a lot of older women actually actively working against me. I think that's always a challenge when you're coming up with an idea that's new, different, or challenging the status quo. But I do find that, uh, not to speak for all elder millennials or for all Gen Z, there is a greater support network in place, and we are much more aware of supporting and uplifting each other. I just wanna say, I absolutely loved that comment about uh, salaries and how actually hmm, providing for your family, why shouldn't the woman provide for her family? And I think, again, we have to get out of these really old fashioned and patriarchal ideas of a man and a woman inside the family unit. So you earn more girl, you should definitely get it. This takes me back to uh, one time my friend said she was, in one of her first jobs after uh, graduating as one of the lead in one of the lead universities in Norway, and uh, one of her male colleagues who graduated the same year as her uh, from the same top university, they landed a job in the same company, uh, pretty much the same role, the same everything. Uh, when she asked him a year later uh, about salaries, she was shocked to find that he was making quite a substantial amount more than her. Uh, for exactly the same job, having exactly the same background, etc. And she was wondering why that was, obviously. And so she went to the boss and asked, and he said, well, it's simply because you never asked for a race. Um, and it stuck with me, this story, because I think that can account for a lot of the inequality when it comes to salary. For women because we don't know that we can also ask for more and we deserve more and we can be valued no, I mean? the last topic uh, yes i think um vocabulary that we use when we introduce ourselves if i say i'm an expert on something men has more of a tendency to be very assertive of who they are and what they do and sometimes you say oh i know a little bit about this and it's not the same if i present myself like i know a little bit about this that if I say, well, I'm an expert on the topic, and a consultant. And actually, sometimes the, the way we present ourselves, because we are educated that way, or we think, um, don't think too more insecure somehow on the being more assertive will help. And I think this thing with negotiating with salaries, I also hear the stories and also myself. Uh, the last year, I um, yes, I got a proposal for a salary and I was like, oh, I think it's good enough. It's like, and uh, I was encouraged by uh, too many in my, in my life, my dad and my husband to say, you should ask for more. And I was like, no, but I think it's what they offer and I think it's good enough. And I like, and I, I, I asked for more and they give me more, but I had to be encouraged by them to do it because I thought it was good enough. So somehow on this thing of your value or how much you can ask and the vocabulary that we use, it plays a role. But we need to also educate ourselves on that because to be more assertive. Absolutely. And I think it's a good example for all of us to follow and to be reminded of that we can assert ourselves and we should. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Livio Bocconiala, you have something to share? I um, will uh, speak from a man's point of view. And I remember when uh, many, many years ago, I was, uh, I was, I was uh, faced with exactly this issue of uh, being in a circle where there are men and women. And I was told by the woman in the group that um, I, she asked me, why, why, why don't I shake her hand? 
And it was the first time in my life when I was challenged uh, on the subject. And it just hit me that it was so stupid not to do it. There's no, it was no logical, it was no educated answer to that question. So ever since then, I learned to greet uh, women and men in a group. And um, I would say, and, and hear this coming from a man, be vocal. Uh, men uh, are very simple creatures. And most of the times they need to be told. And two things can happen. They learn and you educated somebody uh, or they don't learn and you probably most likely don't want to shake that man's hand anyway. Um, so uh, it's a win-win situation. So please be more vocal. Uh, I learned a lot from people like you. I'm taking a lot of notes uh, in the backstage here. Um, and, uh, and I like to empower um, men and women. I like to empower people generally, uh, keeping in mind that it is, um, it is indeed a problem. You, you guys were, were, were talking before um, uh, uh, about the competition. It is a vicious circle. It is a competition because it is so hard to get that position because of the gender issue. And, and, and I, I dare to throw this question out there for whoever can, can hear. Um, if, if, it, if it wasn't a problem, all this gender talk, why, why are we still talking about it? Is it, is it that that some women were crazy enough to uh, get an education and, 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 and race, uh, come from the countryside and become doctors and become teachers and become uh, uh, educated people. Uh, uh, so, so, so I do, I personally do believe that it is an issue. Um, I, uh, one more rhetorical and then I, I just shut up. Um, how, how do all these men who mistreat women, for example, how do they feel about their moms? Uh, simple question. Because they cannot say, you know, like Romanian, uh, Romanian men, they seem to be uh, mama's uh, boys. Uh, they, they cannot say, I love my mom, or, you know, I go and I eat my mom's food, but then they mistreat everything else around themselves. Uh, yeah, just just the rhetoric, just a few thoughts I wanted to throw out there from men's point of view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Livyu. I appreciate your thoughtful comments and questions. Um, I think you inspired Delia to say something. When uh, Livyu was speaking about the fact that he was once asked about a woman, I wanted to say that it is um, um, a way of me when I introduce someone or if I enter in a group, I just shake hands. I'm not a hug person, kisses person. And there was not even one man who didn't shake my hand back. So maybe we just have to do that. Also, with all the COVID and the pandemic, I'm super happy because uh, people don't hug each other so much. I mean, I'm okay with hugging people. I, I love to hug my friends and people I really care about, but I'm not okay to hug people I don't know or I barely see. So these two together, me as already um, making the initiative to hey, hello and shake hands uh, with the context of the society to uh, stand back a little bit. They are perfect now for us to have the same way of being treated. Nobody told me that it's not okay to, hug, to shake my hand. And I really think you should reach out uh, in no matter what field you are or the people you go with and meet with, just do as you are do as you want to be treated because this is something we uh, have to focus i mean you have to do you thank you delia yes i agree with that and i'm taking notes and i will practice what you are preaching